Um, Peter's been asked to speak on these three subjects and uh, numerous related topics over the past year, but he tells me, and it's not quite true because I heard him do it in December, <laughs> never on all three at once. <laughs> I didn't change the words. <laughs> Only once before. Only once before. And Peter's worked with a variety of multinational organisations and he's shown Peter that conventional security thinking has failed to address the challenge that the products of these areas have presented us. So how do we deal with this brave new world? And Peter's a world-renowned world -renowned security evangelist, speaking at conferences and seminars on ethical hacking and social engineering. And he also does a mean Ian Anderson impression as well. That, that only means something, that only means something to those with grey hair in this country. He's appeared in documentaries for BBC television, provided commentary on security issues for TV and radio, and has written many articles on a variety of security uh, topics. Now, I've had the pleasure of listening to this talk already by Peter when I was at BBC HQ in December, and I know that you're going to be in for a great evening. But just before we start, there is a prize on offer. Peter's asked me to say that there's a prize for the first person who recognises what Peter's T-shirt is all about. Peter, over to you. Thank you. Okay, so if you figure it out, you need to wave your arms at me. And that's why I said no sitting at the back, you see. It's not for really. Okay, so thank you very much for an eloquent and, and kind introduction. Um, there are a few people in the audience who I've met before, so um, I don't need to apologise to you. Um, to the rest of you, um, I hope this will be interesting and entertaining. It's a presentation, what I wrote for BCS Irma. Yes, Andy, you're not something to do with Star Trek. That's not close enough. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the right universe. You don't need a prize. You're wealthy and happy to live. But you're happy, yeah? <laughs> Is it a Japanese Sasha? No. This is it? I don't need to talk. Is it a Federation of Planets logo? No. Well, I mean, that's in there, but there's a specific and important reference that if you. I, I'll tell you what. Yes, sir. You can call that. No. Which is a little number of guesses. I'll come back for that. There is a reason for wearing it. I, I have a large selection of t-shirts and I spend some time selecting what I believe to be an appropriate one for wherever I'm talking and what topic I'm talking, I'm talking on or even talking on. So um, this evening I'm talking about these three issues but not really. Um, I'm going to do a small introduction into each of those areas and throw some issues out to you that people are struggling to deal with. We, we as a firm let us move along smartly. Um, just say, oh, that's a nice one, that's please restart your computer. <laughs> it's obviously a, a, a Windows machine. Um, <laughs> we as a firm, um, in the words of my good friend Andy Clark, break things. And that's what we do. Um, we don't sell products, we don't install things, and we don't even try and put things right, although from time to time we're asked for advice on some uh, mitigating or curative activities. But most importantly, we, we try and look for problems. And that means that we get to talk to a lot of interesting people who are quite expert <coughs> in security or quite expert in business, um, neither of whom talk to each other, of course. And we, we spend a lot of time um, compiling mentally a list of problems that we try and share amongst our clients to come up with solutions. This particular topic is something that everybody's struggling with, and no one yet has come up with a nice, neat solution, as far as I can see. And um, I don't think I have either, but what I want is a shift in thinking, and, and that's the focus of tonight. Now, if I tell you, this is your last clue, after this, you're not allowed to shout at it, put your hand up if you work out about the T-shirt, but the T-shirt is all about a shift in thinking, or to use that hackneyed phrase, thinking outside of the box. And we need to have a shift in thinking, in my opinion, and in the way that we try to do security. So, only question I'm going to throw at you um, in any formal way this evening is how many people here, by show of hands, work in some sort of security role, please? Okay, that's about 40% according to my 
um, built-in analytical computer. So for, for those of you that work in security, um, nothing new will come out in these slides, but what I'd like to do is have you apply your existing knowledge in a new way. And for those of you that don't work in security, tell that. Okay, so this slide is supposed to break the ice at parties because it demonstrates pictorially um, my journey through life. And like many people, um, it's a bell curve. Only it's an inverted bell curve in my view because uh, myself um, in my role in the late 60s, early 70s, and me now um, have more in common than me in the middle. Um, when someone told me that if I was going to run my own company, I needed to look respectable, uh, I soon disabused myself of that notion. It's not what you look like, it's how you think. And uh, that's hopefully where we're coming from. So three discrete areas that people are concerned about. You can be cynical and say that each of these areas is um, a label that's created by uh, vendors and by the press, but they still represent a shift in technology and attitude for a lot of companies. Cloud, the important thing about cloud is that as a model, it provides a whole new set of challenges. As a model, it presents a lot of security people with a massive challenge because even when they were already struggling to control security inside the enterprise, now, I won't say, but I will say, randomly, but certainly ad hoc, individuals without significant budget are purchasing cloud-based services to deliver a project or to assist them in their day-to-day -day work. And because that can be purchased with a simple credit card transaction, something, for example, like Amazon's service, which sits in the infrastructure as a service space, can be purchased and used for just a few pounds or dollars a month. So these things are enabled in the business without necessarily going through the formal channels that you would expect or hope that, uh, that new business projects would go through. It means the security people very often aren't even aware that these services have been enabled or, or purchased or rented, and uh, as such, their challenge is growing exponentially. Additionally, in many cloud models, you are effectively giving the function of security to a third party, whilst, of course, legally still retaining the ultimate responsibility. And many of the services that we'll see in cloud um, don't even permit tests to take place. We do penetration testing for a living, and uh, quite a number of our clients have engagements with cloud service providers where testing isn't permitted at all by the vendor. So often, and frequently and increasingly, it boils down to a contractual relationship between the consumer of a cloud service as an organization and the provider of a cloud service. And as you will be well aware, um, that moves it into the legal area. And as we know, that's no surety at all. Wrong way, Pete. Much better. What else is different in cloud? Cloud services as a whole have only been made possible by virtualization. <coughs> For those of you that are not into a virtualization and technology, what that means is lots and lots of pretend computers sitting on lots and lots of more real computers. There's a nice technical description for it. Anybody object to that definition? Um, because they're pretend computers, um, it introduces a whole new bunch of vulnerabilities, and I have a depressingly long presentation that um, I gave to a depressingly large audience of auditors, uh, uh, courtesy of ISARCA some years ago, or a couple of years ago, on exactly that topic. But one key element emerges that I want to make tonight, and that is that in order for virtualized systems to work properly, they have to have a a layer of technology that isn't there on a conventional server, for example, that sits between the metal, the hardware, and the operating system. And that layer is called a hypervisor. And uh, there's an interesting issue around this because um, as far as the operating system and thus the applications running on the operating system are concerned, they, if they had any intelligence, obviously therefore not including Microsoft, uh, if they had any sort of awareness 
that software would still not know that it wasn't talking directly to the hardware. It's talking to a hardware simulator, that is the hypervisor, and that allows this whole code set, the, 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 the tower of operating system and applications, to be moved about independent of the real hardware underneath. And you can imagine that introduces all kinds of interesting vulnerabilities. Like this. If you are the bad guy, I'm, I'm not quite sure why in this particular slide, which I stole from some cloud vendor or other, the bad guy has to wear a hat, but at least it is a dark colored hat and not a white hat. So as a white hat person, I'm pleased to see that. But in one scenario, an attacker, a technical attacker, would want to address one system at a time because that was their choice. When you move to a cloud model, obviously the attraction for an organized attacker is that if they can subvert that hypervisor in some way, this is just one attack example, of course, then they have uh, an awful big win when they're able to control a very large number of systems through one attack. That doesn't mean it's happened or it hasn't happened. Um, it's certainly possible, and there have been exploits that prove it. So there is a massive challenge here, which is masked by the fact that the business in, I have a, a client that's in, uh, they call themselves a luxury brand. If I call them a retailer, they get very upset. So you can imagine what sort of company it is. Who has moved their entire business, roughly three billion pounds turnover, into the cloud, everything. And the same authentication processes are used, whether you are an administrator of these systems, or literally, not figuratively, literally a person on the street who has a vague interest in their services. Which is, a, you know, if you're in security, right now, if you have any hair left, it should be standing on it. So I did a little brainstorm. This is a peak brainstorm, so it's not exactly a, a, a large-scale thinking process. It was just a piece of paper and me in advance of a presentation I did at InfoSec a few years ago, where I thought to myself, what would I do as a bad guy? Oh, there's Ian Anderson, he's coming out. <laughs> so when I'm thinking, for some reason, I'd spend them on that. Those of you that know what that means, thank you. Those of you that don't, so what? So this is just a very quick sketch of some of the issues. And they are massive, massive issues, which are really, really challenging to deal with. And this is just about nothing more than attacks, never mind regulatory issues. If you engage a cloud provider and you decide to put, let's say, your employees' payroll data on there, because HR are a big adopter of cloud services. They love cloud services, because we love HR, right? Who loves HR? <laughs> usual response. Even if an HR person is in the audience, they will not now admit it. <laughs> they adopt these systems, and then no one, even though they've started using systems, asks the question, where does this data actually reside? And a lot of cloud providers really can't tell you because they have multiple data centers in multiple countries and multiple jurisdictions. And, of course, we... Um, operate under British law and EU law when it comes to, for example, data protection and privacy. There are some uh, so-called safe harbor agreements with certain American companies who make a contractual agreement to meet the same standards. And then there is the, the economic pressure which drives our society, which says we want to put it in the cheapest place. We want to put it in the cheapest place if we're the cloud vendor. And we are pressuring them to put it in the cheapest place because we're a consumerist society and want to pay as little as possible. And I was discussing with one of the uh, organizers earlier about whether we like free services or not. And my perspective is that when you have a free service, it isn't because you're paying for it in some other way, classically Facebook, for example. And if you buy a cheap service, you probably think you're buying beef, but you're getting horse. <laughs> Vegetarian. <laughs> Social networking. So Bruce Schneier, well known for loving the sound of his own voice, um, wanting to be an important person in BT and being moderately clever, 
um, has made a, an interesting and important set of observations, most typically that we as a race just need to gossip and to talk. It's in our genes. In the same way, do you know huskies pulling sledges? Do you know why huskies pull a sledge? It's not because they're frightened of being whipped. It's not because there's food at the end of the trail. It's not because they're racing against their colleagues. It's because they love to run. And human beings love to talk. And when that was all in an ephemeral environment, around the water cooler or in the pub, we only had to be concerned about who was actually listening. We do the same thing in social networking environments. It not only is recorded, but of course it's also uh, spidered as well, so it can be searched and retained potentially for all time. And anybody who wants to get into the debate about whether Facebook really removed your data or not is welcome to have that discussion with someone else. So people are doing this implicit conversational response to living, and they're doing it online, and therefore it is searchable by anyone. And general ignorance and, and lassitude and disinterest means that people really don't bother, and really they've got better things to do with their time than to discover exactly what settings in Facebook, in LinkedIn, in Twitter, they should or shouldn't set in order to protect their information in some fashion that they haven't actually really thought through anyway. Which means that certain people could make a business model out of using these environments in order to be able to do massively useful research, predictive analysis, and even, uh, let's say, some what we call in the, in the hacking trade footprinting of an organization to understand who to target with what and why and how. Uh, here's a, a, a lovely, somewhat ancient, because it's more than a month old, ancient slide um, that was put up as a social networking privacy experiment. And uh, basically, it's uh, some really clever analytics that looks at feeds from Facebook and Foursquare, which is the booking where you are thing, you know, people who have to tell you that they've just booked in the Gap Weekend at Port Nelly, just booked in at Helsinki Airport Port Nelly, you know. Personally, my ego is sufficiently large that I don't need to tell people that, but it's a friendly thing to do as well. And here's the sort of output they, they created. You know, who wants to get fired? Who's taking drugs? Who's got a hangover? Um, those sorts of analyses are what we call proof of concept. They're a demonstration of the sort of information that can be pulled from social networking. If you take that same model and pretend you are a uh, a member of an organized criminal gang who has a specific target for an organization, let's say RSA, who make authentication, authentication tokens. It's been a long day, sorry about the stuff. Make authentication tokens for including others, um, suppliers to the US defense industry, um, then you could perhaps use this to target key individuals in that organization and conduct an attack, which they did. And not to be specific about the Chinese government, but they. <laughs> this is the published, publicly published RSA analysis of the attack that was executed against them. And there are lots of points in here that I would love to make. But the highlighted one is the first step in what was a very successful and very important attack was identifying the mark, identifying the target. And a massive part of that is social engineering around social networking. So it's not trivial like what people think. Then, um, uh, when I did this presentation in London, somebody said, what's beyond, I think. <laughs> they were an older group. Really? <laughs> Even? <laughs> no, they were actually. There was some real comments. It was terrifying. That's, um, my, my perspective on this is, you know, don't read the news, read the security news, because that's what we do. Anyway, bring your own device is another unstoppable thing. Picture of an older version of Andy. Um, no, you. Oh. <laughs> There's all kinds of issues around this, but what bring your own device means, if you haven't encountered it, you're lucky. The unstoppable requirement for members of staff to bring their own mobile computing devices 
into the working environment and connect them to corporate data. Everybody's doing it. I have examples that include the US military, that include US defense organizations. At our presentation in London, um, I had a, a question from the audience from this chat who said, um, what do you think about using the principle of BYOD in um, police and security services? And I said, insane, don't do it. And he was very upset because he was running a project to introduce BYOD into the Metropolitan Police. <laughs> I didn't back down on my position, but there you are. Other people in other industries have little or no choice about this, and it introduces all kinds of fascinating problems, because this is deperimeterization taken to the extreme. You know, firewall, not relevant. Antivirus, not present, not at work anyway anymore. Backups, if they're done, plain text, perhaps on the home computer. You're a senior executive. You're far too important to type in a PIN code or a password every time your iPad locks, aren't you? In fact, you don't want it to lock at all because you might just want to use it. You're an important person. Why should you use such terrible controls? And by the way, I must have that iPad and it must be on my corporate network and it must deliver all of the documents I need from my board meeting. There are apps to do that. It must allow me to check my corporate email. And I have no idea whether it's configured securely or not, and I don't care because I'm far too important. It's on me personally, by the way. Oh, um, <coughs> great thing about mobile computing is that it's pushing wireless into the forefront in a way that nothing else would have done. As we roll out all kinds of new technologies like 4G, we're still right now dependent on Wi-Fi. And as I, I drove it, well, I didn't drive, I sat the back of a taxi going through the city after a talk I did last week, and I could pick up a free Wi-Fi point that the City of London has made available uh, throughout its uh, jurisdiction. And I asked myself, okay, so I connect to this, I don't have to authenticate, therefore I know it's not encrypted. And there are people who are sitting there browsing away, checking uh, just plain text emails, transferring files about to services like Dropbox, which had a massive problem last year insofar as half their passwords just stopped working for a period of time. I have no idea who is watching the traffic. Remember, if you're on a wireless network, it's radio. Any electronics engineers here? Yes, hello, all nice people. You know that it's radio. It's designed, hello, to go through walls. It's omnidirectional, mostly, and that means if you're on a hotspot and I'm on a hotspot, I'm going to see your traffic, aren't I? There's nothing technical or clever about this. So interception of mobile devices becomes a trivial exercise in most cases, just at the point when we've got all of our wired networks to be switched and therefore less vulnerable to this sort of sniffing exercise. We introduce a technology that steps us back in time 10 years so that we can uh, introduce that problem again because we need the convenience and we need that whole flexibility of working. And of course at the same time, it, it amazed me, depressed me, how few people put together multiple vectors. We used to think like that, but so many people don't. I think well, you've got open Wi-Fi that people are using for this convenient, they just need to do it when they're traveling. You've got mobile devices with little or no security, and it's like, in terms of configuring the thing, it's like, you know, it's like keyhole surgery. If you've got a nice big screen on a nice big computer, you have at least a vague idea of what to look for in the browser to try and hope that you haven't been hacked. If you're on a, a, a little mobile device, no matter what brand, don't care what you can't see that. It, it suppresses a lot of information. The sites are designed to suppress information. The browsers are designed to suppress information to optimize the screen real estate, to give you as big a picture as possible. So it's hiding things that you otherwise would expect to see. Combine that with something like Twitter, which means that because of its constraint on 
uh, on a length of a tweet encourages the use of shortened URLs so you can't validate the website you're going to by reading the URL and combine that um, with some of the hacks that have been published and work very well for compromising the key thing we think protects us when we're transmitting information across public networks and that's SSL and you've got a real storm. Well, the, I tried to get the press to listen to three years ago, InfoSec, and we talked about what about the fact that so many websites um, might well authenticate you using SSL, HTTPS, but then switch back to HTTP for performance reasons, that they don't even know how to set the right flags in a cookie to make sure that you can't then be bumped onto a, a plain text connection when you authenticate the next time. But they don't uh, put controls in place to stop someone hijacking that token and masquerading it to you because they captured it and replayed it. It's horrendous. But it's too technical, so we won't record that. And then there's, yeah, really, there's tons and tons of malware for, for mobile devices. Who's an Android fan? Good, I see you hate security. So, it's great because it's open and it's free. What do we get when it's free? No controls. What do we have when we've got no controls? Personal responsibility. What are people fed at? There's lots of lovely hacks out there aimed at the consumer. That same technique could easily, probably is easily, being targeted against um, a corporate employee as well. These are all fake. Um, authentication boxes which are designed to undermine two-factor authentication. So it's an arms race. The banks say, oh, we can't use username and password anymore. We have to have all kinds of additional controls. Um, we could have two-factor authentication, but if people are traveling, what we can't do is ask them to carry a, a device that you put a card into and put a number into to get a number out to type it into the phone. <laughs> people don't want to do all that. So instead, we'll text them something and then that's a side channel, right? Because you know you're using the web for the interface, so we'll text. That's okay. It's out of band. And then we'll transfer the code. Don't work because the criminals are two steps ahead. There's a whole list of bring your own device challenges here: the data loss, the unintentional disclosure of information, hijacking on open networks, and the, the rebirth of phishing. You know phishing where you get the link in the email, because all of the controls people learned and started to be built into clients like Outlook are out the window because we're on a new platform. So the criminals can replay the sorts of attacks that they were successful with a few years ago on a desktop or a laptop. They can reinvent those attacks exactly the same way onto the new mobile devices. And of course, they're multifunctional. I never trust, I, you know, I'm a science fiction fan. I used to watch Fireball XL5. I used to watch Star Trek. You know, Star Trek, they had a thing where they did it and talked to the Enterprise, right? But it didn't do anything else. It didn't play music or take photos. That would have been bonkers. So now we have multifunctional devices, which means that they're perfect for surveillance, aren't they? If we can install some clever software on the phone, it becomes an audio bug, a video bug, uh, a keyboard intercept anything you want. I mean, we couldn't have invented it better for the criminals, right? And there's all kinds of opportunities. It's a phone, so we'll bring back dialer You remember when you used to have a mode, yeah? yeah. We can have a competition now. Who had the slowest mode of over, right? Okay. So either, either a 30 up, 300 down, or whatever it was. Can't even remember now. Anyway, when you had modems, one of the great things these folks used to do was to infect your computer with some software that would cause it to keep making calls out and run up costs. You know, to premium numbers, because the modem could be forced to dial a, a premium number and just squeak at it. Well, that's come back because mobile phones are great for that too. And there's all kinds of premium numbers and yada yada. Tired? Because I am. This is exhausting stuff. One more swig, I think. <laughs> Come from a long line of non-drinking Methodists. You know. Here's the other side of the problem. 
We're seeing the business driving forward as fast as possible in order to make money. Yeah. And that's what it's supposed to do, whether it's making money for shareholders or for investors. What happens with the security people is they hear all the sort of stuff I've been ranting about for the first half an hour this evening, and all the other things they've had to put up with through the rest of their career, where they know that all kinds of stupid decisions are being made from a security perspective. And yet they have this much skill in convincing the people who really drive the business forward that it matters. So they develop a mindset, because they've got to keep themselves safe, that the people driving the business forward are like second-hand car salesmen, and they're just out for the money. Or the horse meat. Management, on the other hand, sees the security people as constantly wittering on and being the preventers of, of making money, being Dr. No, one of my colleagues said, that he got caught in, uh, in a large corporate. So we get this massive disbalance between two mindsets. Now, how is this helping anybody? So you're getting the picture of where I'm going in a minute, but it's how we go there that, that I want to explore with you and, and maybe introduce some new ideas. Hmm. What's the problem when Security person, walk off camera. When security person goes to the boss and says, "We've got all these problems with BYOD, you know, because of data leakage and the fact that we can get malware on the phones, and that means that somebody can install a keylogger." At this point, the CEO, the CFO, even the CIO has fallen unconscious <laughs> because all they hear is. <laughs> So what happens next? All the security pundits say to the security folk, you need to learn to speak business speak. You need to be able to talk to the business in terms that they can understand. You need to be able to talk to them about the balance sheet and how security adds value and isn't a cost overhead anymore. Now, I've only met about three security people in the universe who would know how to do that or want to do it. So we've got a, a, a suggested solution that is never going to work. Because it's like, you know, when I first started First Base, which was back in right, 1989, one of my first clients was Claxo, you know, because I set my sights quite low um, shortly before I got the business at the Bank of England and London Stock Exchange. And it was a lovely guy at Claxo, a really nice IT guy. And I was... Well, I always have been fairly naive, but I was even more naive than by several orders of magnitude. And I thought, if I'm going to get more business from this chap, I need to be sociable with him. And, you know, I'm a techie, right? I'm a geek. Being sociable is like, we can talk about Jeff Rotol, we can talk about Marvel comic books, we can talk about movies as long as they are accurate to the original canon for Star Trek, for example, and, you know? And in 10 seconds, they will fall asleep. So I, thought, I need to talk to him about things that normal people talk about. So I, I attempted, and by attempted, I mean I got out one sentence on the subject of um, what the British call football. And he said to me, you don't know anything about football, do you? And I said, no. My idea of sport was hiding uh, behind the pavilion and having a cigarette. And so he said, well, really don't try. And I took him at his word, and I stopped trying to do that. So that was when I stopped having the haircut and the tie thing. You know, that all went out the window. And I realized then that um, it's very difficult for someone who's truly an, a geeky engineer to think in conventional interface ways, and doubly difficult for them to talk to someone who's a trained chief financial officer. I think it's unrealistic. And we have another set of, of, of issues that, that I'll just throw into the mix, and that is in any large corporation. Now, we've got multiple players, by which I mean, you know, when I went to work, the people you sat next to also were paid by the same company. That's a strange idea, isn't it? And now, you know, you go into a bank, and you're sitting next to people who work for Capgemini, and people who work for Fujitsu, and people who work for Tata, and TCS, 
and, and heaven knows what. So, you know, you've got cultural differences in the workforce. I mean, business cultural differences. You've got different drivers and different objectives. You have, thanks to the, um, the, the wonderful government, government of the 80s, um, a distrust, which no political status here, between employees and employers when we introduce terms like human resources instead of people. So we've got all kinds of factors here that are working against someone trying to enact change. So I thought, here's my suggestion, and it is a suggestion, it's not a solution. Let's tell a story. <coughs> because that's what people bite on. It's what people are interested in. Remember, we're gossiping animals. We like stories. That's why parables work. That's why the great religions of the world use parables to teach them. Don't make jokes about the Pope. Okay. Um, that means that instead of saying there's an Ujimi flipping me Watsi fire and it's going to need a thingy bob with blue flashing lights to fix it, which is what the CEO and the CIO and the CF, because don't believe the Chief Information Officer knows anything about technology because they don't. Apologies to any CIOs who do. They probably work for an engineering firm. <laughs> so let's build a story, and let's build a story in the way that RSA did, but even more um, consumable. So we don't worry about technology. But we talk about the bad guys who are going to attack us. We talk about um, the methods they might use. And importantly, before we lose the audience, we also talk about what the effect will be at the end. Now, if you're good, so anybody here done sales? All right, great. So, congratulations on sitting here. Um, why do people buy things? Is it A, logic, or B, emotion? Emotion, 100% of the time. Doesn't matter how good your proposition is, it doesn't matter how much you think you're making a decision based on, on cost, in the end it's an emotional decision, because that's how we function. So, let's use that as a technique to sell security in specific use cases so that people actually want to do it and become our evangelists. There now, I've said it. Now for the science bit. Does he use harmony? <laughs> I read a document created by Her Majesty's Government and it didn't make me laugh or vomit. Now, this is unusual. I found it was sensible and useful. So I took it and improved it, of course, because my ego is quite small. And what I decided to do was take the basic principles and turn it into a vehicle for creating a story, a use case, with a moral and a conclusion, which is personal to the decision maker. And that's what I said earlier, why do people buy things? Everything, in the end, is down to you, your health, your family, your safety, your continued happy existence, your driving your soul, your owning your iPad, and all of the things that you want. If something threatens that, it will be personal and more interesting to you. So what I tried to do is say this. Look, here's all the technical words. Well, they're quasi-technical because they're about risk talking about what is the scope of the particular exercise, what is the business impact level, and so on. And instead of using those terms, those of us who are security or risk professionals can use this strategy, this methodology, but the other skill we need to have is either to be someone who can convincingly and charismatically lead a meeting, a small meeting, and be brave enough to say, no, shut up, I'm, this is next. Or hire somebody who does. So behind the scenes, what we're thinking is this. As a business, we have a use case. Let's suppose that we have an HR department that already uses a service that allows its employees within the business, physically within the premises, to uh, through their PC, log on to the system, and check their pay slips. 
Apparently this is a requirement in large organisations. Personally, I don't have a pay slip, so not an issue for me, but normal people do. They want to know when they get paid, they want to know how much they get paid, they want to make sure it's what they think it should be. It's a normal service that an HR department has invented to deliver. And there are lots of people making money selling such systems. They had this in place already. What they wanted to do was open it up to the point where those same members of staff, and only those same members of staff, could sit at home and do this. And this is something driven by the employees who want to have this facility, and, uh, and therefore the rather unusually sensible uh, HR director said to the people that normally test their systems, not us, can I be assured that this will be secure? So that's like saying, you know, am I going to live forever? The answer is no, but you can make it as long and as pleasurable as possible. If we're talking about security, you can make it as secure and usable as possible. Balance between the two. So the, the testing firm refused to engage with that and said, sorry, no, no systems are secure 100%. We're going away, goodbye. So this is called missing a business opportunity. So I came along and said, why don't we, well they invited me, but I sat down with them and said, why don't we convene a workshop, this is trendy management speak, so that's the hit already, where we sit around the table, um, we talk about the system that you want to implement and how it differs from what you're doing at the moment from the HR department's perspective, that care about technology. What are they trying to do and how are they trying to deliver it? And we'll have some IT people there as well, because we like a good laugh, and they will be able to tell us what technology are being in, is being used to deliver this, and I will absorb both pieces of information. Then I will lead you through a discussion that says uh, questions like, what's the worst could happen? You know, when I was quite young, which is a long time ago, and, and was feeling quite depressed as teenagers get when almost anything happens, really. And someone said to me, when you get up in the morning, look in the mirror, look yourself in the eye and say, what's the worst can happen? And then work from that basis upwards. It's an interesting statement. It worked quite well for me because it, it gave me a complete disinterest in the future. And <laughs> <laughs> I just take every day as it comes. I'm quite surprised and pleased when I wake up. And, and as, as Oscar Wilde said, I can't understand people that don't drink because when they wake up in the morning, that's as good as they're going to feel all day. <laughs> so, step one was, what's the impact? What's the worst thing that's going to happen? And I explained to them that there were three sorts of problems they should consider because I went back to security basics. Confidentiality, as in this information leaks out in some quantity to some audience. Integrity, which means the data could be little and twiddle and cause terrible problems. And availability, which means they can't get it when they want it. See how I speak Englishish? <laughs> and then, what would the business impact be for you as a department? Because this is the HR department. So, not quite the same um, levels as here, but the same principle. So, for each of those use cases, I said, well, number one example, the information leaks out, and um, everybody in the world can see all the pay slips of all the employees. How serious is that to you? And because um, they were a not-for-profit organization um, who provide a facility to go and look at old things, you can work out what sort of business that is. I don't mean it's an old people's home with visitors. <laughs> <laughs> it would be of level three at worst, and so on. So we, we assign a value to it. And it's very crude and simple, this, and if you're a risk specialist, you'll take a big stick and poke lots of holes in this. Don't care, not interested. What I'm trying to do is two things. One, help the business to understand the problems they're facing and come to a sensible, financially viable solution. And two, educate them so I don't have to keep doing it in the future. Yeah, teach to fish. So then I introduced them to the concept of threat actors. <coughs> this is not Laurence Olivier on a bad day. This is when you identify who might cause a problem, deliberately or accidentally. And we said, what sort of threat actors might there be? And who might influence them? And so we talked around who didn't like museums. 
um, if they had been, but they weren't, um, an art museum, then they could be threatened by an organization called Art Not Oil that objects to the fact that BP sponsors some art exhibitions. So if you're super left-wing and green, you can really invent anything to be excited about. Personally, I'm more excited about food, wine, and cars, but then I'm old school and over the last 30 years have moved from Marxism to fascism. Each of these use cases was chatted through and we talked about different threat cases. Who might they want to attack this particular organization? What would their motive be? And as they learned to think like that, they would of course then volunteer very quickly their own ideas of who might want to attack them. And we boiled it down to a very sensible list. Then we said, okay, from your, your list, and let's suppose it had been a, a pressure group that has a strong political conviction about the involvement of, of organizations like petrochemical companies being involved in museums, and if that was their motivation, how technically competent are they likely to be? And, you know, they made a value judgment on that. How skilled and how much resources, how much money, how many man, woman, person hours, can they throw into this objective? Are they more likely to continue their activity of coming into the, uh, the, the main hall of, of, let's say, the National Gallery and chucking paint on the floor? A very creative form of terrorism, I always think. Or are they going to migrate into cyberspace and start to mount attacks then? And if they do, what sort of attacks are they likely to be? Obviously, denial of service, I think. <coughs> And if it's denial of service, they're probably not going to be targeting a payroll system. They're going to be targeting the website, which would give them the biggest publicity. So we talked through this, and I understood the rationale. So I'm just whiteboarding it all, flip charting it all, and just writing down the ideas and working through this workshop. What's their motivation? Um, how, how committed to this activity are they? And we multiply those numbers together, and we end up with uh, a threat matrix. So if we've got, a, uh, let's say, a, a group with limited capability, but they're very committed, they'd be classed as a moderate threat. So we just start to rank things, and we produce a list that we can give our attention to in order of threat level. So if they're you know, the, the Bank of England, um, and they think that one of their threats might come from the Chinese government, then they could say, well, the Chinese government has formidable capabilities and can be extremely focused, so I think they're here. If it's a, a, a payroll system as a museum, probably not so much. They're trying to put it into context. So we then work through each of the types of, you, of actor and we talk about the capability and the motivation and we list them out. So we did that matrix for each type of threat actor. Then we get a table of threat actors. Then we apply that threat against the value of the information. Okay. This is not a course on how to do this, by the way. It's a concept. So you know, I'm not going to take notes at the end and test you on your memory which slide is which. But you can imagine that out of this comes um, a list of risks and what risk level we think we should apply to them. Who are the attackers? Who's behind them? How committed are they? How skillful are they? What's the value of the information um, for each of confidentiality, integrity, and availability? And then we can produce a prioritized risk list. At the end of the exercise that we conducted with this HR department, we had a list of only five things, and none of them were higher than me. And then we moved into the, the really clever bit where we talked with the user department, not some propeller heady Pete Wood person. We asked the users, what controls do you think would be sensible to help mitigate this risk? What controls could we put in place? And they came up with the idea of um, using some sort of geolocation system to make sure that the IP addresses only come from the UK, and then a number of person around the table said, well, what happens when people go on holiday to Italy and they still want to check their payroll? You know, so they had this debate amongst themselves, and all the time they're learning. By going through their own decision-making processes, 
They're learning how to do those decision making processes. Didn't look like this. People weren't as clean or pretty. <coughs> so then we produced a, 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 a target list. People can deal with lists, especially lists that are in sequence, they're prioritized. What they can't do very easily is work with a sort of lot of vague stuff. Because they panic, run around in circles, 10 things go around their heads all the time, they can't focus. By drawing this together, this whole process took about two hours. But bear in mind, this was the first time they'd ever done it. At the end of that process, I left a, a, a head of HR and the head of HR's immediate uh, report and two IT people with the skills that they would need to counter any such questions in the future and to be able to make an intelligent decision and not to object to controls which they had jointly decided were a good idea. So then it just comes down to business impact versus cost of control. And they're already motivated to look for a nice equitable solution, not for some fancy uchi wuchi software and hardware with lots of flashing lights that can only be sold to someone who's a security analyst because I only speak the right language. So I would propose to you that the other alternative is to exist as we do at the moment. On the left is how most large corporate senior management react to security challenges. And on the right is how the security folk in most large corporates feel about it. Which results in that? It might not be a write-off on an exploding car a la 1960s movies, but it can be a nuisance, it can be difficult to recover from, it can be moderately expensive to fix. And more importantly, you just keep doing that, you're never getting anywhere. The business is thrusting forward with great enthusiasm, uh, with all kinds of new technologies, and, uh, and rightly so. But it's always the business feels, whatever that means, that security people are like an anchor trying to hold it back. But at the same time, the security people want to do it properly, want to be professional, want to do a proper job, and feel they're being rushed all the time to, to a solution that hasn't been properly thought, thought through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Similarity. Fantastic. Yeah. I've jumped out. Okay. Challenges, questions? Peter, I just want to ask, I'm not in security now, but in the 1980s I worked for a government department in Gloucestershire. Um, really? We can imagine what that is going to be. Well, it's very difficult, yes. yes. Be careful um, with the men sitting behind you. No, no, no. <laughs> it was not so. But I remember what we were doing at the time was it wasn't so much doing something to somebody, but doing something which had an effect, but they wouldn't notice it had an effect, and they'd know that we hadn't even been there. And I think a lot of the security we're talking about now is that a threat's going to come, it's going to ruin your business. The best stuff is when they don't even notice it. Absolutely. Like, our challenge is outside the government arena, or even in it yes. now, that um, the marketplace is dominated by vendors of security products, who, bluntly, in my opinion, even the well-meaning ones, have partial solutions at best which do not communicate with each other, that don't work cooperatively, and often introduce... I mean, just on my desktop, I, I was an early adopter of, of antivirus, of course. I was an early adopter of a personal firewall. And these two products, every time they get updated, stop the other one working. And in fact, sometimes stop the machine working. So, you know, that, that, that's a microcosm of the problem. Plus, in the commercial model, sadly, and it sounds awfully damning, and I apologize for this, but it's my experience, the senior decision makers don't. They push the decision down the tree. They, I have one, more than one occasion, but a recent one where the, the chief information officer said to one of the security guys, <laughs> bear in mind this is a three billion pound company, and they had three security people. They now have one and a half. Really? 
and that's normal in retail. Said to one of them, I understand that the Verizon have told me, because all of our Verizon, that there's a new report on vulnerabilities out this year. I want you to read it for me and boil it down to one slide, please. <laughs> now, I have to say, we were discussing earlier, this is why we're unemployable, isn't it? Because if somebody said that to us, we would have to kill him. <laughs> I mean, it's just a neat solution. You would have colleagues in, in, in colleague agencies who would do that for us. I think, you know, that would be the right solution. Let's just wipe them out. But then we wouldn't have any business. So that's the problem. To be surreptitious about it, when honestly, in the retail sector, I know an, an organization with 80,000, 80,000 employees, 80,000 and more nodes on their network where they just reduced their entire security department from six to three. For the world of wine. And another one where they're massive, they have six. You know, it's not like finance where they might have 20. So there is a challenge of resourcing and of a complex environment and of no hierarchical structure either in the organizations at the whim of decision making. It's not a world I would much rather live in your world. Why a massive world. Um, okay. Sir Adam, sir. You first. Right. Um, I have worked in the centre um, for a while again, but I work for some organisation you know, you know, um, I've always been in a world where um, the value of all the information which is available is simply becoming less just because we are all living in a world where it's all available. I mean, you know, data is, you know, is partly valuable, but it's rarity value. If everyone's got my you know, your pin number, well, you know, that's the end of me. But if I've got everyone's uh, pin number, they've all got each other's you know, pin numbers, it kind of, what's, I think, these ideas I could have half of them. And certainly sure you what you're saying there. And I think, you know, we, I think there are two drivers here. Plus, there's two social drivers, old school and old school natives and second generation old school natives, who have a different value on privacy. And I think if you were to apply that question to privacy, then um, the answer is I think it will become irrelevant. But the, as a, in a capitalist society, which I'm now part of, and didn't used to be. Um, we see a, a model that says there is, there is certain information that is extremely valuable for a particular period of time. Uh, as with always, as with cryptography, time is as important as issue as any other. So th there is always going to be, if there is a competitive society with clear objectives, there would always be precious information over a period of time. And thus, thus I think, there will always be data to protect. I fear, in, just to conclude the response, so, <coughs> in many of my clients, most struggle with any form of uh, information classification or valuation. Many don't even have it on the balance sheet. Certainly, they have no methodology to help any number of staff identify which information needs protecting over another, plus they expect IT to do it through some psychic ability. And so, the challenge is to identify that most valuable information at the time that it is or is going to be most valuable and protect that. But no one is looking at it. Sorry, I just said to me, Maybe up there, sorry. I need, I need to have more of your signs. You. It's a t-shirt, it's a no-win situation unless you do like the... Say again? Your t-shirt is a no-win situation unless you do like the... You win. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a selection of goodies will win their way to you if you give your details to Mr. Wilson. Yeah, wave your hand, Mr. Wilson. Oh, thank you. Okay. We'll do some t-shirts and more too. <coughs> Andy. Um, you, you mentioned, um, I think, slightly off the ground. Really? You know, new, new thinking, and then you roll out CINA. Yep. Is, yeah, it's all very exciting. Um, if there are new businesses that have got very fast pace, where people say, 
I'm going to start a new business now, and actually I don't care if it's not here in 18 months because I'm sold it. Yep. Um, so actually I'm not that bothered, as long as I just keep ahead of the game. Yep. To what extent do you think that people are interested, not so much in the confidentiality, integrity, and credibility, but the auditability of what's happened? Massive. Because auditors are, you know, classically the people that are hated with a deep and burning hate, um, and it's often a bit that gets turned off. But in reality, when you've had a major incident, you can retain a lot of your business credibility by saying, yes, actually, we do know what happened. Um, and we're taking multiple steps, we'll go out again, and we've learned one lesson. Rather than standing there with your mouth going, open and closed, and nothing much going there. Do, do people get auditability in your I think, well, there's, there's been a few pieces written recently about whether um, the greatest threat is now the auditor. Interesting, I don't know if you've read any of that, but if not, <coughs> it's coming from the same mindset as you, I think, that um, organisations are more concerned about um, whether they will be caught, whether that's PCI DSS or, yeah. or whether that's Sarbanes Oxley or, or whatever, than doing the right thing. But in a, in a high frequency turnover business like you're describing, none of these systems would work because there's no one interested in it. I'm talking about more stable businesses, I think. I wasn't purporting that CIA was new. What I was purporting was that involving the business intimately in a storyline is, is an approach that I haven't seen yet. Yeah, I accept you. I accept you. But um, in your, your example, I, I am not the right person to ask because I have little or no sympathy with that mindset and I wouldn't choose them at the time. Because I, I couldn't deliver what they need because I'm fundamentally a moral and, and, and structured person and I can't change that this light in my body. So I think if there's no one in the business that has a, an interest in protecting the business and the livelihood of the employees by doing things at least semi-rigorously, but rather lives so much on the top of the wave that they just jump off onto the next wave. And I fear most of our workforce Maybe in, in a few years, in the people, a few generations, they will be that agile and that educated and that used to looking after themselves. But we're coming now from a point in society where, surely, in the post 60s, we developed so much of a, a nanny environment that people no longer look after themselves or know how to. So the employees in that world will be so divorced from the people driving that sort of firm. Uh, but they will be bound to something. Well, not if all the employees are moving at the same rate. No, but I don't think they are. And I think that's the whole point. <laughs> and maybe in some, in, in some small percentage of society. But Joe Average has been brought up, and even his parents have been brought up, to think that there will always be a safety net. And it's only now that people are pushing back and complaining bitterly that the safety net is being withdrawn. Because of they couldn't have any decision making in the investment in the first place. So I think it's in society it's surely too early to adopt a model like that unless we want to destroy society itself and just leave an elite few who can move at that speed. I know I could survive in that environment, I don't think you could. But I don't think 95% of the population. Did anybody, was anybody queued to tell me this? So I'm useless at this. I'm sorry, I thought you said if you become a fascist, that last oh, that comment. Oh, that self-deprecating. <laughs> it was intended to be self-deprecating, but as you get older, I think you, to some degree, become um, less tolerant. Um, I don't mean politically fascist, I mean. And so I'm a, I am a grammar Nazi, sadly. But um, there are other elements where, let's just say, my decision-making cycles have become faster. And perhaps a little too judgmental due to that. It's trying to show the value of security for those businesses. It's getting harder and harder as so the time goes on, mm. especially with the recent sort of attacks on some of the sort of high profile businesses. I mean, yep. businesses that have had some high profile attacks um, where reputation damage could occur as well as losing data. Doesn't seem to have affected their businesses. TK Maxx is still very strong. Lockheed Martin is still very strong. RSA is still very, very strong. Yeah, good recovery. Recently, 
2011, obviously Sony and very little attack. The thing that disappointed me, especially about the Sony one, was, uh, and they again saw sort the of trend of attack, taking nearly a customer's details were stolen in that attack, including credit card information, etc. The IOC fined Sony, uh, not Sony, but it's on, um, £250,000. Equates roughly to about eight pence per record. Um, that's how much. Yeah, the sign is mine to the equates to about eight pence. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's about eight pence per record. That was lost, and that's how, how much the IOC find the sign rates on other people. Privacy to it. I mean, for business leader, looking at that sort of fine and, and the way that the companies have found this back, um, why would he want to invest 10 million? security to protect his customer data box when he actually he probably lost it. He could probably maybe buy a at any point. That's exactly my point because I don't think I think that battle's lost. Which is why I I I, I propose a much more um, parochial and tactical response instead. That you you work in cells and you spread the word from middle up to change the operation of the company in real time to understand the merits of security which they have decided works for them. I'm not proposing that this sort of solution will always deliver a result you want because there will be plenty of cases where they won't talk to you or they don't want to get involved. And my fascism is I abandon them. What I wouldn't ever do, I, I mean you couldn't pay me enough money to, to be the CISO for a major corporation because you're automatically doomed to failure. The only solution you have, which many take, is of course to just hop firms all the time and, and continually um, move on. But that isn't my mindset either. So I think, you know, if I, I have been invited in and I have successfully changed the mindset of uh, some very large projects simply because of the that, that final impact would have been so significant to the reputation and thus profitability of the company. I don't think that in any case it would have killed the firm, but it would have called for the head of certain C-suite individuals. They would have had to go, which at best would be inconvenient for them. It would have resulted in some real brand damage because it's retail that is double important typically, particularly in what's called the luxury brand. It's kind of in their title. So they would look at that with a great deal more attention. The, the, the trick of it is to identify, like a good salesman does, <coughs> what the pain point is, and then to say, let's work together to devise a strategy that adequately minimizes the potential of that pain being being realized. And don't pretend it's easy, that's not my that's not my my philosophy. It's like that um, major high street retailer which work will be. And they the PCI came out and they just ignored it. Yeah, they just paid the time. Yeah, it's just, just you know, yeah, it's because it's the cheapest thing to do. Yeah. And my, my for for twenty years I I misunderstood because of my naivety. And assume that people running companies actually care. <laughs> I, I, I dislike being a cynic. It doesn't suit me. Do you think we're individuals? I mean, you take the Sony thing because people like Sony. They can basically get away. With, well, I think a lot of kids do. They can basically get away with it because people. It's a bit like oh, it's Apple. A, Apple yeah. recording all your information. Exactly. You, you're prepared to forgive them as an individual because you like them as a company. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that, compensating control. Yeah, it's that emotional aspect of it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah, think yeah. we need to, as individuals, be educated as well? To say, well, actually, what we should do is say, no, we're not going to buy the products anymore until you sort this out. Yeah, <laughs> my socialist roots and so on. If we continue to, to, to consume product from the cheapest source, we will get what we ask for. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 I've never bought into that. So I shop with a car loan, my first name. Because I want what they deliver to me, when they deliver it, without things missing, without things broken, and a one-hour window, not two-hour window. I'm prepared. You know, I'm one of those guys in the outer circle that's prepared to pay for the added value as I perceive it. 
and, and that has to do with the space I operate in because that's like okay. But as a society, we we constantly live in this mindset where on the one hand we say, oh, it's all full of high streets are disappearing, and I used to love going to my local X, Y, Z. On the other hand, um, we're going to spend all our money at this thing. You know, stupid. But then human beings are very good at that sort of contradiction. Otherwise, religion would be difficult. <laughs> Anything else, Rufai? Well, I suppose at least he's interfering with people's problems. <laughs> So we arrived at a council of despair. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where all security people live. Um, because we're, you know, I mean, why do we hate traffic law? I don't do traffic No, good, I don't know. I think they do a great job. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the press tells us to hate traffic law, does it? And, you know, everybody seems, I mean, I went, I had breakfast down this morning, it's unusual. So to go and have a blood test, which I'm very bad at because my brain's hollow. But um, anyway, so I rewarded myself with a coffee in the, in the restaurant. And the only newspapers I had were the Daily Mail and Daily Mirror. So, you know, in my judgment, I have a t shirt that says, I'm the one the Daily Mail warned you about. That's one of the t shirts I wear if I go to the press. Room. And you know, I couldn't see anything in either of those newspapers. That was remotely important, interesting, or well written. And you know, the guy sitting at the table opposite me said, What about that, Marlon? What's the name? Something McCutcheon. Now, I don't watch television, I don't think that is. But apparently, you know, they were then judging this poor woman because she'd been successful, she'd made a lot of money, now she's going bankrupt. So they made the media same decision, the, the waitress and this guy. And, you know, this is why I don't like all these people. They're having this discussion about, you know, well, they all do that, don't they? So what data are you basing this on? Do you understand scientific principle, you morons? <laughs> so, you know, if, if, if that's where people come from with their judgment, and they bring that into the workplace, then, you know, I mean, I had somebody rant much worse than me. My God, much worse than me. Um, he was in, in the pit of despair, the seventh hell. So he was just ranting about senior executives and how they're far too important to do anything and how they won't listen and how they just demand things. I mean, if you can't <coughs> run your own business, you're going to have to poke up with that and find a way around it. And my perspective is that, you know, for someone, because security people are generally not at the top of the tree, and I'm not sure they ever will, because it's not a popular discipline in, in, in commercial terms. So the, 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 the solution, in my view, is to win friends and influence people in the business units at a similar level in the hierarchy to understand why you are constantly talking about these issues and how it can help them protect their jobs and their futures and the growth of the business that feeds them. And, you know, just soldier on like that. Life's never spent to be easy, would it? There's lots of senior happy security people in China, but <laughs> well, look at the resources I've got. But then the Americans make it easier. They said, we don't surrender to you as secrets, we'll build a factory in your country. Yeah, it's marvelous. Isn't it? Would you like to build them into our regions? Good. Plan. You can't take over the staff because you're still our secrets, so the Chinese said, we'll buy a staff car instead. Yeah, well, this is why people grow up and die because you just can't put up with the gentleman. <laughs> I think we're going to have to call the halt now, ladies and gentlemen. I know we'd, we'd all love to carry on for ages. Um, once again, can we thank Peter for an excellent... Thank you for your time.